And now we really have a special treasure and treat for everyone. And uh, Carla Horowitz, uh, who has been working locally, and whatever her message is, it is go local. And the reason that we have as many people here in the room as we do is frankly because of Ms. Carla Horowitz and the fact that we actually have found a way to inform and connect with some of the early childhood educators right here in New Haven. So um, it's fundamental and it's important and we're remarkably grateful and you can see that right there, Dr. Carla, the floor is yours. Uh, I have titled this uh, presentation from the, uh, from the front lines of early childhood. Um, the image isn't exactly a peaceful one, but it's meant to highlight the seriousness and crucial nature of the work early childhood educators do with and on behalf of young children and their families. I feel very humbled to be in the company of such a distinguished, passionate, and dedicated group of policymakers, researchers, national and international advocates, and practitioners. My voice is one from the front lines, though it's not from areas of conflict that we've heard so much about today. I also uh, would like to thank you for inviting me to participate. For 40 years, I was director of Yale's Calvin Hill Daycare Center and a faculty member at the Yale Child Study Center. I still am. Um, I've been a teacher of children, and I continue to teach undergraduates at Yale. I've been a supporter of parents, a mentor to generations of students and teachers, a consultant, and a member of multiple committees and boards that work on behalf of the care and education of young children. I've been in the early childhood field for a long, long time. And I do not have to tell you, the condition of too many of the world's children and families is dire. And the adults aren't doing so well either. But rather than focus on the crisis, I want to share with those of us who dedicate their lives to nurturing young children in the family child care homes, daycare centers, preschools, and other early childhood settings have learned and have to offer in helping children to become moral beings and empathic thinking, feeling, and caring citizens of the world. Early childhood educators are uniquely positioned um, uh, to guide at least, oops, sorry, <laughs> at least in um, this country, um, children's development in all domains, and in fact, around the world. Many schools for young children focus more and more relentlessly these days on readying children for real school. That involves numeracy and literacy and other academic pursuits, all of which, of course, are important, but which are not the only skills and knowledge children must learn. Spending time with young children every day our job is to teach children to live in groups, to begin to take another's point of view, to be in touch with their feelings and those of others, and take responsibility for their actions and their words. Supporting this social emotional development is crucial if we are to have hope for the next generation and for the world. So as teachers perform all the tasks of teaching and caring, they're also fostering moral development in the most intimate, personal, immediate, and meaningful ways. For example, we help children to really see and understand the natural world as we bend down to look at the shiny pebble or the sprouted acorn or the caterpillar inching its way along a leaf or the brave flower still blooming in the season's first snow. We help them to observe, talk about real things and real life and real feelings, learn new vocabulary, new concepts, and we foster their curiosity and their joy. Everything is new to young children. They are scientists exploring the world 
and we are there to notice with them, celebrate, and develop what we call emergent curriculum, and appreciate and help them to hone their skills and increase their knowledge and understanding. So too do we support young children's social emotional learning from their calm and kind intervention in the inevitable experiences that happen every day, like a grabbing squabble, squabble over a toy. A teacher helps children to really see the consequences of their actions, understand the feelings of another, and find a way to resolve a real and powerful conflict. The teacher may say to the child who has grabbed the truck, young children express their needs and wants physically before they can use words, look, look at his face, he's crying, he's upset or sad or angry because you took his toy. Would you like to play with that truck? And waits for a response, a head nod or a tearful yes. Let's see how we can work this out so you get a turn too. And then the teacher helps children to find a way. Maybe you can say, can I use that when you're finished? And the teacher helps the other child to agree. This is conflict resolution and peacekeeping and cooperation right at the beginning. It's also anti-bullying curriculum, which starts long before middle school. The lesson emerges from a real and powerful event. It recognizes that both children have feelings and rights, and that there is a way to peacefully resolve a heated conflict with words, a plan that makes each child feel heard, and to eventually get what they need. It takes time, lots and lots of time, but it pays off, and it really is the beginning of empathy. Sensitive teachers work this way with young children all day, every day, and their role is a powerful one. You'll notice the teacher didn't just tell children you have to share, whatever that word means to very young children, and leave them to their own devices. They need the teacher to support them and teach them through words and actions and modeling what sharing really means. And she didn't require apologies. Children can learn the stock phrase, I'm sorry, but it's not just sorry. Conscience is an internal voice motivating to be kind, respectful, and fair. It involves repair, not just apology. Helping a child notice a flower in the snow and helping a child see the feeling expressed on another child's face are all part of the teacher's role. We hope to instill a sense of wonder about all living things and a respect for other human beings. So I want to close with some real examples moved up the developmental continuum of what children with this kind of support are capable of. I have a book which you probably can't see, but it's called The Fairness Helpful Book, and it was published by the kindergarten at Calvin Hill Daycare Center a few years ago. Um, and it's full of the children's words and the children's drawings. Uh, and here's the introduction. On one occasion, the teacher discussed with children at meeting a problem with setting up rules for riding bikes outside. The children kept in mind both their search for a solution to the problem and their sense of fairness. Through the process of drawing, the children were able to communicate their ideas, to listen, to respect different points of view, and to work towards a sense of resolution or justice. Um, so here is a meeting that the teacher, Winnie, uh, is holding. Winnie got serious and asked the children to listen carefully. We have a problem and I would like to ask you for solutions, she said. When we go outside, some of the girls feel like only boys are getting to ride the bikes. And some of the boys say that it's only a couple of boys who get to ride the bikes. Can we think of some solutions to this problem? Many students participated in the discussion of possible solutions, but one of the boys stood out as a main contributor. He suggested that the teacher watch the students to make sure that everyone gets a chance. He noted that this would mean that the teacher would need to be out on the playground before the student, so a student would have to hold the door. Kids are really concrete, right, at this age? 
One of the girls began her idea with, I would suggest, and explained a system of crates that would separate the boys and girls and their respective bikes. A boy responded, this might be her thought, and then suggested that the teachers call the girls to line up first so that they get to the playground first. <laughs> Winnie pointed out that the teachers may forget to call the girls first, or they might not want to. And the boy said, then we would go to another solution. Ultimately, they decided to be aware of how much time they spent on the bikes, make sure everyone got, gets time, and get off a bike when a teacher asked them to. So these children have had a lot of experience with being listened to, with being respected, their thoughts matter, and they can be trusted to know what the problem actually is, because they usually do, and to come up with some solutions within the scaffolding of a teacher's careful direction. Um, I have one more, um, which is, this is not my words. Uh, I teach undergraduates theory and practice of early childhood education, and they have to um, keep a weekly journal of their observations from their practicum in the classrooms, uh, and then their interpretations. So I will end with this. Um, when I stepped into the preschool classroom one morning, the children in the reading corner were finishing up a book with an illustration of a dove, and the teacher had just asked them their thoughts on the definition of peace. Audrey answered, living together. Juniper said, hugging each other. And Sophia added, no fighting, followed by other children's input. Some of their responses, this is the interpretation, some of, my, of their responses warmed my heart as they were unexpectedly personal or anecdotal, and I realized that children understood seemingly complex abstract concepts in terms of their own life experiences. For them, peace meant embracing their friends and getting along with them without arguing. I thought nothing more of the discussion on peace, however, until it was playtime outside, and I happened to come across Sophia as she was busily drawing on pieces of paper next to the crates. I asked her what she was drawing, and her explanation eventually brought me back to the conversation the children had in the classroom. Sophia was drawing on three papers that she planned to put up on the crate house she had built with the other children. On the first paper, Sophia drew two people with arms stretched toward one another, and she asked me to help write the word cooperative next to the people. The second paper had a picture of multiple people standing next to each other, which Sophia described as everyone. On the third paper, she drew two people again, but this time they appeared to be engaging in a fight. Sophia informed me that the picture meant no crashing. All in all, Sophia was conveying through her drawings that the crate house was built together as a group. It was meant for everyone, and no one was allowed to destroy it. I was thoroughly amazed at the multiple levels. Um, it surprised me that she thought to use her art as a way to symbolize her ideas. Sophia was clearly operating above the level of drawing in which pictures were simply replications of what children saw. Her drawings represented something more than what they literally portrayed. They were signs containing messages she wanted to convey to those who came to the house the children built. I was further taken aback by the breadth of the message she was delivering. She not only made sure to explain the collaborative effort behind the building of the house, but also emphasized its inclusive nature and warned against any action of harm or destruction. Then, I finally realized that the talk the children had about peace earlier in the morning inspired her to create these signs. Recalling the definitions of peace that her peers had offered, Sophia thought of bringing those ideals to the playground where she imagined harmonious and respectful coexistence to be beneficial. Um, let's see, I witnessed a compelling example of guided exploration of themes and events that are relevant to the life of children in the larger community, which is what the teachers um, were doing at that meeting. Um, and Sophia made this amazing connection between her world, her daily experiences with the other children, and her drawings. So that was a four-year-old. Um, 
And I think that's how we teach peace. If you wouldn't mind just staying here for one moment, I guess there's a part of me that really wants to thank everyone that's here that has been devoting their lives to the care of young children. And if you wouldn't mind standing up and giving this lady a standing applause <laughs> for all of the work she's done for decades, I would be grateful. Oh, thank you, Jim. It starts local, and here it is. <laughs>